Hi, everybody. This unfortunately already our closing keynote for the first day of our global Ad virtual upsec 22. Uh, this one is Shira Shabam, technical expert with a focus on cloud security. Currently, she is as co founder and CEO of Solvo, the first application where cloud security solutions. But I don't want to go it wrong because she said she will introduce herself. She's a professional in cybersecurity, has been military in an intelligence unit. Strong beliefs and empowering woman. That's what you see on her t shirt, as she showed to me. Um, she is very represented in the community and technology world. She is volunteering, lecturing, monitoring. She's a, uh, 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 a, a very enthusiastic and devoted, always uh, volunteer globally and in Israel. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Shira Shavan, please, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Martin, uh, for this introduction. And hi, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, um, good evening to all of you in Europe. Uh, for me, this is good morning from San Francisco. I am at the RSA conference right now. I hope, I'm sure you had a very good day today at APSEC EU. And hopefully um, uh, you will find some, some interesting uh, uh, topics uh, today and in the rest of the uh, conference uh, uh, as well. Um, so let's get started. So as uh, uh, Martin mentioned, I am Shira. On my day-to-day -day life, I'm CEO and co-founder of Solvo. Solvo is a platform that helps developers, DevOps, and security teams to keep a least privileged cloud application automatically. Uh, um, if you want to learn more about it, we can talk about it later. It is not the topic of our uh, conversation today. But other than cloud security, I'm also the co-chair of OSP Israel. Uh, but uh, I have to say that my greatest achievement in life has nothing to do with cybersecurity. Uh, a few years back, I was working for a company that got acquired uh, by a large corporate. And thanks to, to this acquisition, uh, what happened was that the corporate made a change in their policy and they became a dog-friendly company, uh, thanks to my dog. So I definitely feel like this is my greatest achievement in life yet, uh, that made a difference for thousands of employees worldwide. Uh, but now you know everything important to know about myself, so we can get started and talk more uh, about business and about cloud security. Uh, OWASP Top 10, uh, I think most of you are familiar with this project. Uh, but if not, I will just say that this is a community project uh, that started many years ago, actually almost 20 years ago, uh, where co the community and the security experts point out at uh, the most common or the most popular risks and security issues that we're seeing in, uh, in applications, in web applications, um, uh, because we want to raise the awareness and help developers and everyone else in the process to adapt a smarter and more secure way to deliver those applications. So that for, it's for us, for the end user to feel more secured um, about it. Um, now, in 20 years, the world has changed, 20 years since OWASP uh, uh, was established. Uh, the applications that we create changed, the technologies that we're using changed. So obviously, uh, the top 10 risks that appear in those um, in the document that is uh, uh, being published every few years also update and change over time. For me as a cloud entrepreneur, I was curious to take a closer look at the impact that the cloud made to the application security landscape. I want to remind you that when the cloud burst into our lives, um, it was kind of a data center alternative. It wasn't supposed to uh, be what it actually became, or I don't know if it wasn't supposed to be, but we didn't dream the cloud would become what it is today. Uh, uh, and I will show you my thesis around it, but I think that there is a very thin line today between application security and infrastructure security. They actually go very well together. So in this talk, we're going to go back in time, 15 years back actually, to look at OWASP top 10 and how it changed from uh, 2007, I will be starting from the top 10 of 2007 until today. The last OWASP top 10 was released in 2001. 
So this is a 15 year perspective. Later, I will share with you my predictions uh, uh, or my assumptions, they are all mine, not an OWASP official uh, uh, opinion about uh, uh, the future of uh, OWASP top 10. So <clears throat> one other important thing I have to say uh, before we move forward, uh, I'm going to share here the top 10 uh, from 2007 until today. I did some digging into the uh, um, OWASP documentation that is available uh, to everyone on the online. And occasionally I found some inconsistencies in the order of appearance of the um, risks. So during this talk, I will not be uh, referring to the ranking of, of the, um, the risks. Uh, so don't look at the order of appearance. If something appears on the top, that doesn't mean it was number one that year. Uh, let's just focus on the risks themselves that appeared in, um, uh, in every year that we will be talking about. We're not going to talk about each uh, risk specifically. I just want to look at the overall trend. In 2007, we had some new uh, newcomers, some new uh, uh, risks that showed up this year. Uh, uh, I will be highlighting in green the new risks that came in this year. Uh, so CSRF, insecure communication, and malicious file extension were new at new 2007. It's interesting to see how those things are still relevant um, today. Now, in general, for the sake of our conversation today, I will be grouping uh, the risks in into two categories. Uh, I did this uh, uh, dividing. It is not a, an OWASP uh, uh, terminology. Um, I look at two groups today. One is the user and application interaction category. And the other is backend and infrastructure related um, risks. Uh, the user application group is looking at the interactions between the user or, and the malicious user and the application. So that could mean code injection, that could mean URL manipulation and these kind of things. So in 2007, we saw, um, four risks that belong to the group of, uh, of the user application interaction. I will, I will be highlighting that in yellow throughout uh, uh, the entire talk. So green for new risk, yellow for the user and application uh, uh, risk. So um, in the backend and uh, in the backend group uh, uh, of vulnerabilities of the uh, risks, uh, we have the encryption, we have the authentication, and we have the network. Uh, we will see how these evolve over time, but this is 2007, and this is where we are starting. Now, the next thing I want to do after we talk about the vulnerabilities is what happened in the cloud world from the day of the, uh, uh, this uh, document, the OWASP document was released until the next one was released. What happened in the cloud uh, world? So really important stuff to talk about uh, uh, between uh, 2006 to 2010 uh, is first of all, uh, first of all, you know, uh, an important reminder, OWASP was here before the cloud. Uh, OWASP started early 2000 and AWS was born in 2006. Um, a year later, our good friend S3 Bucket came to the world, still very popular to this day. And it's pretty amazing to, to think about how popular uh, it is and how we can't uh, uh, create any application without using it. In 2008, Google uh, released the Google App Engine that later became uh, uh, what we are familiar with as GCP. So this is when these guys came to the world. <clears throat> Moving forward in our journey in time, to 2010, two new risks uh, uh, made a first appearance that year, the security misconfiguration and the uh, uh, unvalidated, redirected and forwards. Uh, by the way, according to the 2010 documentation, misconfiguration uh, was also include, uh, we refer to misconfiguration as uh, also unpatched packages, exposed admin pages and server configuration. So. Today, when we talk about misconfiguration, very often we relate to things like leaky S3 buckets. 
we saw S3 back it's only 2007. So when in the OWASP documentation, we talked about misconfiguration, we still related to more uh, uh, traditional and classic uh, uh, misconfigurations and not to the cloud misconfigurations as we know them today. Um, so uh, another fun fact is that security misconfiguration was a part of OWASP top 10 of 2004. It had a little, uh, uh, the name was slightly different, insecure configuration management. It was dropped out in 2007 because it wasn't considered to be a software issue. However, uh, from the organizational risk uh, perspective, it cleared. It, it was clearly a part of the top 10. Uh, and this is why the team that built that document decided to put it back. So let's get back to my uh, classification of risks. And in the um, user app, uh, uh, domain, uh, 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 the risks that we have, now we have four of those. Uh, the previous year we had four, now we have five. Uh, uh, in my world, again, in my definition, these risks have to do uh, uh, with the interaction between a user uh, and things that, uh, between the user and the application, uh, uh, a malicious user as well. So they, when we're talking about things like uh, uh, getting access to unused pages, unpatched flaws, uh, unprotected files and directories, um, if they're unauthorized uh, uh, to do so. And in the backend group, we are still mostly talking about uh, uh, encryption and network. So no massive changes over there yet, but let's move forward. What happened during this time uh, um, in the world of cloud? Uh, in 2009, uh, the cloud infrastructure is becoming more dominant. Uh, it is the go-to for startups and for enterprises that are creating new applications. Some of the enterprises are still in their on-prem and legacy uh, technologies. But just wrap your head around it. In 2009, the cloud market size was $58 billion. Recently, in 2001, it was over $300 billion. Microsoft were a little late. In 2010, they introduced us to uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, as you guys and girls probably know, uh, uh, Azure today is the second most popular uh, uh, cloud vendor. Uh, so they, uh, they beat uh, uh, Google in the race. We're getting closer. Uh, uh, to, to, to nowadays, uh, we're now talking about the OWASP top 10 of 2013. Uh, this year, we only had uh, one new uh, uh, entry, maybe not exactly a new entry, uh, more of a merge between insecure cryptographic storage and insufficient transport layer. They both became together sensitive data exposure. Um, so not a lot of news uh, uh, in OWASP this year, but on the other hand, we had some very interesting things in that period of time in the world of cloud. Um, in uh, 2013, a company named Dot Cloud released Docker as an open source uh, uh, tool aimed at simplifying the usage of Linux containers and making them accessible for everyone. If you're not familiar with dot cloud, <laughs> this is because today we just know it as Docker. Uh, so think about it. This is uh, uh, 2013, that's almost 10 years ago. Uh, it feels like only today we are really uh, getting the hang of it and how to use uh, 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 this technology well and securely. 2014, Google launches Kubernetes as an open source container orchestration system to automate application deployment and scaling and management. So again, these are things that are now very, very, very popular, but back then that was just the early beginning. Uh, uh, 2013, we were also introduced to AWS Lambda, the serverless. Uh, so no doubt that this period of 2013-14 uh, uh, was very, very interesting in the world of cloud. And I think that at this point, 
we're also seeing a, a, a tipping point in the uh, top 10 risks at OWASP. Uh, we will start using things less uh, uh, user application kind of uh, risks. It's not that they don't exist, but we're seeing more risks in the world of backend and in the world of infrastructure and how infrastructure is becoming more relevant uh, uh, to our world of risk management uh, uh, and the popularity of those risks. Um, we're in 2017, we are almost, we are almost now. Uh, uh, so we're almost uh, uh, over with our uh, journey in time. Uh, OWASP top 10 uh, brought us uh, five new risks. Uh, uh, one of them was emerge, broken access control uh, was insecure direct uh, uh, object reference and missing functional uh, function level access control. So these two uh, uh, became one risk. Uh, insufficient logging and monitoring, in my opinion, is a risk that definitely has a lot to do with cloud. Uh, the place where we became dependent on third parties to provide us with services that uh, uh, we, we must keep track on and make sure we are on top of every event uh, and every incident. And we need to make sure which data went where and how come this event happened this way and not another, uh, made us uh, uh, desperately need logs uh, uh, coming from other products or other services that we're using. Um, logging was also important in on-prem days, don't get me wrong, uh, but this time we need them even more because so many things happen that we might not even be aware of. So I think that logging became an issue because of the popularity of open source code, uh, multiple security operation products, uh, just the, the multiple products all over the place, not to mention uh, using multi-cloud uh, and even hybrid cloud. And of course, uh, uh, more open source and different frameworks that we're using. Um, according to my classification, another thing that we see, uh, uh, this year we only had two uh, user application uh, uh, risks. Uh, the other ones, the, the backend uh, uh, kind of risks, are uh, exploitable or uh, uh, Martin uh, corrected me that we don't look at them as vulnerabilities, but at risks, but they're exploitable, uh, of course, but uh, from other levels of the application, they are not really in the user interface, uh, at least in my classification, the way I see it. So we're moving away from the user application interface, going deeper, into uh, uh, the application, the backend of the application, the third parties and the different services that we are using in order to make this application functional for us. Um, so this is where I'm taking this now. So the backend is related to uh, uh, the vulnerabilities that now have to do with data, uh, with access to data and different resources and with authentication. And as we mentioned before, the logging. So this is getting interesting. We're leaving uh, the area of the users and getting closer to the backend of the application, closer to the technology. Um, at this point, I, when I was looking into the history of the modern history of the cloud, it was getting harder for me to identify groundbreaking events uh, uh, for, for the cloud domain. I think it's because it became such a mainstream and such a, such a popular uh, technology and natural technology to use in our life that uh, um, maybe we take things as granted, but when I wanted to, to look badly for you know, more groundbreaking events, it was getting harder. Now we made it to the OWASP top 10 of 2021. That's the light, less, latest a release of OWASP top 10. Uh, uh, this year we had three new entries or three new risks. One of them it was a, a renaming and expanding of, of the existing definition. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see that in 2007, 
client signed request forgery was a new entry. And in 2001, the server side request forgery was a new entry. So you see where I'm taking this, right? We are moving away from the user closer to the backend. Um, again, if we take a look at my classification of the risks, we will see that we grew further apart from the user. Basically, all we have left in the um, user application uh, a group is the injection. The other risks we have to do with uh, have to do with the code of the application, the component, uh, the components the application is using, and basically this is a, a area I like to call it plumbing. Uh, plumbing means that we connect different uh, uh, components together that we didn't build, uh, making sure that all the different parts work well together. They enable sm a smooth flow of data and the functionality of the application, even though we didn't build each part uh, specifically by ourselves. And th this time it includes access control, authentication and encryption. And this is why uh, at the last version of the OWASP top 10, we only have a one user application related risk. Again, this is my, my take on it and the take on, on how the cloud made us move apart from the user interaction and closer to the infrastructure and backend. Um, so this is, again, in my opinion, the biggest change uh, that the cloud infrastructure brought to application security. The fact that the infrastructure is an integral part of the application and we can't do application security without taking a very close look at the infrastructure, the cloud infrastructure. And to make sure we use it correctly, it is well configured, it doesn't expose our data, and uh, uh, not our data, not other people's data, not data of the application, and only the necessary entities, an entity can be a user or it can be another cloud component or an external cloud account, only the necessary entities get the necessary access that they need. Uh, in your cloud application, on average, you have dozens of third parties and uh, uh, other SaaS uh, products that are connected to your application and you want to make sure that they only have access to the specific data and resources that they need. It's really easy, right? Uh, I know you can do it. So, we went over uh, uh, the OWASP top 10 from 2007 until uh, uh, 2021. But what does it mean for us? Um, <clears throat> to sum up the going back in time, this, ta this part of our journey, uh, uh, there are a few things I want to share with you. Uh, we saw that from focusing on the code of the application and the user application interface, interface the OWASP top 10 is showing more risks that have to do with behind the scenes. So we no longer, uh, it's not that we no longer manipulate URLs to get access to the, to the hidden data, but we can find it in a misconf misconfigured S3 bucket. So today we just have more ways uh, uh, to do some nasty stuff. We no longer need to exploit broken authentication we can see that you assign an admin role to an internet facing EC2 machine. So we can take over that. These kind of risks existed in the past, uh, but uh, they certainly exist today, but they just made some adaptations into, um, into the cloud world. Uh, in the past, they used to be uh, a part of the IT team to, to make sure that uh, the servers are not exposed to the internet. So the developers wrote the code, handed it over. Security was a silo and uh, we, didn't do ha we didn't have to do anything about it. But today it's a part of the CI CD process where we actually have developers and DevOps and security team involved in the process. So it's a flow, no more silos and everyone has to work together. So all of us need to make sure that uh, it's a joint effort uh, uh, to secure our application and our data, no longer separate uh, teams, but now everyone is actually working together on this. Um, in the 2017 report, 
the writers created a very nice infographic uh, of the previous uh, uh, risks in previous reports. So I took the liberty to create an updated version of this uh, uh, um, chart. Please feel free to take a screenshot uh, if you want to get a kind of a, a overview of how the OWASP top 10 changed in the last 15 years. Uh, I will also ask Martin later if we can uh, publish this as uh, some kind of a white paper or put it in the OWASP uh, um, website for everyone to use. Uh, so feel free to dig into this and see for yourself how different risks went out of the OWASP top 10. That doesn't mean these risks don't exist anymore, but we, you have to prioritize, right? So theoretically, we could have had OWASP top 100. But we, when we had to choose the top 10, these are the ones that made uh, uh, the cut. Uh, and in, it's really interesting to see how they change and adapt over time based on the new technologies that we see getting into our lives. Um, so I promised you uh, I will talk about uh, uh, my predictions, uh, which again are my own. I don't think I have a lot of news here. I didn't come up with risks that you're unfamiliar with, but I try to maybe look at what I'm seeing, uh, the events and the incident and the breaches that I'm seeing today and kind of guess uh, 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 where is it going to hit us and what, in my opinion, makes sense to see in the future uh, uh, OWASP top 10. Um, so in a, in a way, we finished going back in time and now we're going forward in time. Um, and the bottom line, in my, in my opinion, uh, uh, is that there isn't a lot of news. Uh, we previously didn't see um, uh, any specific API risk in the OWASP top 10 in the previous uh, uh, reports. Uh, even though, please remember that there is a dedicated project at OWASP for API security. Uh, I think that uh, uh, API risks and vulnerabilities are going to grow bigger and bigger on us. Uh, and other than that, I think we keep on seeing the same things, generally speaking, over and over again. Same mistakes, guys. Uh, leaving credentials in text files, putting it in Dropbox, uh, not ro rotating uh, keys, giving everyone admin access. These are all things we keep on seeing over and over again. We have to stop with this. Uh, relying on code, we didn't write. Remember the chaos we had a few months ago around Log4j? Uh, remember that just a couple of months ago, Okta, the service that all of us are using, uh, got hacked. And through that hack, their customers got hacked. Uh, so this is a, sadly a good example to using third parties. Um, this, is, this is crazy, but this is the world that we live in. Uh, misconfiguration and architecture, to me, they mean that we just have to plan ahead and threat model. Uh, and we also have a, a dedicated OWASP resources on that uh, that you can feel free to use. Um, now, where are we going with this? You're probably wondering uh, what does this mean to you and what can you do to improve your application security posture in the cloud? So here is my take on this. First of all, shifting left. We talk about it all the time, but still we find it very, very, very hard to implement. We'll be seeing more developers finding themselves touching the infrastructure, not because they want to replace the DevOps, but because they want to move faster. And if we want them to move faster and to deliver faster, we need to enable them with a security, with a secured way to do it. So we will need to implement automated DevSecOps and infrastructure security tools to make their life easier and to make our life, the security people life, less stressful. Um, I mentioned the term plumbing before. Uh, this is uh, uh, the terminology that I like to use in the case of talking about different services and components that we didn't write. We connect them together and call this an application. Uh, the more we use the cloud, the more we use managed services, the more we use SaaS solutions as a part of our application, 
this is more plumbing that we are doing and we need to learn how is the data flowing exactly where to filter it how to identify a leakage how to make sure that only the necessary access is granted uh, i think we'll be seeing a lot more uh, plumbing issues uh, uh, so to speak in the future so prepare yourselves and prepare your team for this mindset of becoming uh, um, security plumbers. Uh, last but not least, we are all using third parties all the time. At the end of the day, if, if Okta uh, uh, got hacked, so who are we? Uh, uh, and through, through Okta, their customers, so actually no one is immune to these kind of things, no one. I don't rely on my vendors and I don't rely on my external products to keep me secured. This is our responsibility to make sure that our infrastructure, our backend, our data are all secured. We're not going to QA the other products. We are not going to pen test the other products while we go through an audit. I mean, unless you really want to, I don't think it is our job to pen test uh, um, the other products. Um, so always remember that you are responsible for your own application and keep in mind that those third parties uh, might and might not be secured and the fact that they are compliant to something doesn't mean that they are secured and secured enough and securing the standards that uh, you would like them or you would hope they are secured. Um, always prepare yourself for a potential breach or a potential hack. Uh, and I think that uh, this is not news to you. Security is like an onion. You have layers and layers and layers. You can never have 100%. Um, so keep in mind that you should also know in which layer did you keep the data and what kind of layers did you put around it uh, and where are the third parties uh, uh, around those layers and what kind of security layers are you putting around them to mitigate potential future um, risks. So at this, I would like to thank you today uh, for joining me uh, to a journey in time uh, uh, from, OWASP 2000, from OWASP Top 10 2007 until 2021. Uh, I will be taking some questions now. And if anyone wants to reach out to me uh, later over LinkedIn, over Twitter, feel, please feel free to do so. Thank you so much, Shira. So I hope everybody liked. So we have some questions from the customers, uh, from the attendees. Uh, one is the first one is um, over the years there are mobile top ten, the API top ten, the Docker top ten. Shouldn't this be cons consolidated, or are the guidelines that tell what to follow for what on how to avoid confusion or increase awareness? Uh I think that this is the challenge that uh, uh, any security practitioner is facing. I can tell you that I'm here at RSA right now. Uh, you look at, you walk at the expo, you have dozens of security uh, uh, companies telling you about the importance of the risk that they're going to mitigate and resolve for you. At the end of the day, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, your application and you know your crown jewels and you need to work your way around it. Uh, OWASP has, very good and very up-to-date resources. For example, if you go and take a look at the uh, other OWASP projects, not only the top 10, but the API top 10, the serverless top 10, you will be seeing some commonality. There are some mistakes that repeat themselves uh, and we see them in every project, right? So authentication is something that we see everywhere. So if you decide, uh, and I think that you should tackle authentication and make sure you do it correctly, if you do it once, uh, it, it, it covers uh, other security aspects as well. So there, I, I wish there was one single source of truth for the top 10 things uh, everyone should be doing in their application, but it really differs. You know, Some applications are on-prem and some in the cloud and uh, uh, some uh, also have a mobile application and some don't have any PII. So their risks are totally different. Uh, their potential of damage is totally different. Um, so I just think that 
you need to analyze your application threat model your application and then start obviously with the most with the things that could cause uh, the biggest damage and can give you the quickest or maybe not the quickest but the biggest impact on your security and start with that uh, if I may add, so it's indeed we have about risk in a context. And of course, in several contexts, you have the same risk. But I would like to point out it's an OWASP project, it's the Open CRE, the Open Common Requirements Enumeration. It's kind of linking the requirements where they come from by context. So it's not a one on the mapping, but the mapping, like you have the, for example, authentication. You can see where the requirements for authentication come from by what standard or which version of what standard. I will put it at the answers as well. It's a nice one to add. Great. Okay. The next question was perhaps about the future, uh, the prediction. Perhaps insecure software supply chain will be on the list in the future. What do you think? I think that uh, um, it's very, it, it might be so. I think that any third party that we use, software supply chain, but also, you know, also, uh, uh, cloud infrastructure. I look at it as a third party. It's not exactly software in this in the sense that we copy and paste uh, uh, from Stack Overflow and put it into our application. But if you think about uh, uh, using AWS Cognito, for example, the uh, authentication service that AWS has for you, what's behind it? There is some code that someone else wrote. So I look at it. In a way, just like you mentioned, uh, uh, the third party uh, uh, software uh, uh, um, supply chain, I look at using a managed service the same way, because this is at the end of the day, a piece of code someone else wrote. So I think there is definitely room to put in the fu future uh, uh, OWASP top 10 using any kind of third party uh, uh, service as a part of your application. This is a supply chain issue. Uh, I might mention one very interesting uh, incident that happened a few months back. Uh, AWS, someone at AWS accidentally, I assume it was an accident anyway, uh, made a change to the security uh, uh, policy for S3 bucket. For the support role, they accidentally added a permission to read items out of S3. So for some time, if you used the support role for S3, AWS employees were able to read items out of your S3 bucket. Uh, so this is, to me, it's a third party big issue. Uh, and when we talk about mitigating the third party risks, thinking about the roles that you have enabled in your account and maybe not allowing uh, the service uh, support uh, for AWS to be active all the time is an interesting layer in the onion and you don't have to enable it all the time. You can enable it just when you need it. Uh, I, I like the security onion uh, methodology. <laughs> I have to think about that. There's some maps about uh, the security onion. I also, when I, uh, to this point, it's when you say, talk about supply chain, I was wondering when it came up because I know that many years ago, Josh Coleman of I'm Recovery talked about supply chain cleanness and he had a method uh, alignment of the car industry where one uh, brand has less suppliers uh, but more external part the other one has less external part but more different suppliers so the one who goes for quality the other one the, the pricing and then you see the differences so you have to have what in, uh, do i import and that's for our, our top 10 2017 as you showed it they had a using components of known vulnerabilities and now it's the let me see it's the a6 it's vulnerable and outdated components. So definitely supply chain and this external components, it's more on the radar now, definitely for attackers. Because open source, right? Yeah. You, everybody yeah. is allowed to contribute and we all did it for the best and now people will use it for the worst, definitely. Another question we have is, is the current release cycle of the over to 10, three to four years, enough for the future? What do you think? Mm, it's a great question. Uh, um, I think that, in theory, we could have uh, updated it maybe every year or two, but would you run a very thorough assessment every year or two? I think that organizations don't do it that frequently. Uh, um, so at the end of the day, the OWASP top 10 is kind of a mirror uh, uh, 
to what we are seeing. Um, maybe, maybe three to four years is too long and we can shorten it, but I don't think that every year is uh, uh, necessary in the sense that are we really going to take action based on a new OWASP top 10 every year? I'm not sure about it. Uh, but Martin, what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, I think we need to take action. I'm always worrying about people demanding, like, hey, we're almost up 10, and now it's shaking all up our application security, posture, whatever. It's an awareness document. People forget it's not a complete list. It's an awareness document. And if you base your security posture on OS 10, it's like you trust one tool for your security validation, right? Or your insecure validation, how you want to call it. I'm always scared about people calling that because it's an awareness document, use it, it's, it's not a truth, it's not a complete set of requirements, but you know. So yeah, that's my, it's like almost, I cringe my teeth when I hear people like, yeah, I think that say something about the maturity of the most companies. Um, another good question I heard is like, what do you think about a single biggest concern for organizations running in the cloud? Hey, uh, so of course, it's a difficult question. I can say my opinion about it. Uh, um, so we talked a little bit before about the plumbing and connecting different components. Very often in our cloud application, we connect, we not only connect components from uh, uh, the AWS marketplace, the, the, the different services that are available there, but we even connect external services, external uh, uh, um, vendors, external SaaS products, external uh, 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 AWS account. And we do this connectivity in the cloud using uh, uh, roles and policies and not policy like uh, I don't allow uh, to connect to the internet, but a role and a policy is a part of IAM, identity and access management. And I think that today uh, the really nasty AWS or cloud native hacks, but also the really good security mechanism to fight it is identity and access management. And this mechanism exists in AWS, in Azure, in GCP, in, uh, in, uh, GCP. everyone should make sure that uh, uh, their permissions don't have too many holes in them or don't have any holes in them if, if possible. Uh, uh, I think that the biggest failures that are cloud native not uh, I forgot my credentials uh, uh, in my code in GitHub, but the cloud native incidents happen because we have enabled too much access to our crown jewel and resources. Uh, uh, the example that I gave before about giving uh, the EC2 machine admin permissions, I have I know someone in their company, I'm not gonna say who, that for all of their Lambda functions, they use the same role. The la each Lambda is doing something different. If you use the same role for all the Lambdas, I can take one of them, exploit it, create myself as the attacker with admin permissions, you will never know about it. Uh, so the cloud gave us uh, uh, this great power of creating an identity for every cloud component. We are using it the wrong way. So theoretically speaking, I can take one component in your cloud application and make it assume a role that can assume an admin role and I can take over the entire account. People are unaware of this and it's very, very, very simple to fix and to prevent. So I think that this is the single uh, point of failure, but also the, the place that would give you the best security value for your time. I think it's a perfect loop back to our uh, opening keynote about the insider threats. And because what uh, Lisa said back then, she sees companies, they fire somebody or someone will be laid off for whatever reason. And they said, oh, everything is good because we disabled the account or the account will be, a password will be reset anyway after several weeks. And they forget they have the non-profit, the non-personal, the service accounts externally, like, oh, we have the shared account on this external service. They haven't thought about it. In fact, it's an interesting one, yeah. yeah. Um, let me see. I have seen many companies that do a lift and shift, so they take applications as is and do it to the cloud because otherwise it costs a lot of money, right? What do you think about that? It's funny. I a while ago I was talking to someone from one of the big cloud vendors, and they shared the statistics I was not unaware of. 
they told me that uh, about 70% of uh, uh, the compute power today is still on-prem, not in the cloud. I thought it would be the other way around. I thought most is in the cloud and a little bit is still on-prem. So I think that, uh, first of all, lift and shift is still a big challenge. I thought that, I mean, I was under the conception that now the challenge is cloud native. Lift and shift is still a problem. It's a big problem. And yes, there is a challenge because if you lift and shift the architecture and the technology from the on-prem and just make it run in the cloud, you are not enjoying the benefit of the cloud. And I'm not even talking about security, even the cost is not uh, optimized if you just lift and shift. I know that sometimes you have no choice and you have to start it this way and re-architecture and rewrite the application later on. Yes, it happens. And um, I think that when thinking about lifting and shifting and migrating to the cloud, always remember, there is no place for you to connect your firewall anymore. Uh, it works differently. And <laughs> you have to, if you don't have the knowledge in-house, you need to bring in uh, the consultant that will give you, that will give you again, the, the, in, the, the things that will quickly give you the value of just, you know, making sure that what you have here, that you just lifted and shifted is secured. I think that the cloud vendors uh, uh, can give some help in that extent, uh, it's difficult. Consider uh, uh, rewriting the application if it makes sense in your organization. I think that uh, sometimes it's not as difficult as you think. You put some things in a container, put your data in a, in a cloud database, and things are going to work smoothly uh, uh, from now on. Um, just remember that if you lifted and shifted some things you had uh, in the on-prem, like code and packages that you had over there. Uh, sometimes people migrate a, a COBOL applications to the cloud. It doesn't always make sense. <laughs> so think carefully before you do it. Yeah. I think that's also a good question is when you look at the clicks and shifts, so is that what is the overlapping of the application security and cloud security? Um, the overlapping, uh, look, the code is code, right? If your code is vulnerable, it is going to be vulnerable in the container, in the cloud, or in the basement uh, in your office. Uh, and OWASP is still about applications, right? So the code that you write or the code that you copy and paste, uh, <laughs> you need to make sure it's not uh, vulnerable and uh, the, that you understand the risks that you put inside. I remember that there was a company that tried to have uh, this hardened environment, whatever, how bad your code is, you can deploy it and the environment will take care, it's more secure. And unfortunately, it didn't work out. I would have loved to see this work, but it was kind of awkward. Anyhow, there's one more question. It's like, on the principle of least, oh, sorry. <clears throat> on the principle of least privileges, on the plumbing, which strategies do you think work best? in a dynamic environment. For example, in a principle of least privileges in a secure groups for Kubernetes? Mm. Okay, so least privileges is, is, a, is a very important principle if you're building a cloud native application. The, the cloud vendors came up with it as a part of the shared responsibility model. They tell you, hey, we are responsible for bare metal, you're responsible for everything else, and you make sure that uh, 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 permissions are always reduced. So I think there are some, uh, uh, even open source tools uh, uh, to help you um, try and look where you can reduce security permissions. Uh, um, uh, for example, Netflix released some open source tools uh, uh, that can help you see which permissions are uh, being used and uh, which ones are not and statistically, you might be able to, to reduce them. Um, and, and it makes sense if you want to um, make your application list privilege or lister uh, uh, to take a look at one of these open source tools. I can uh, look for my, I have a list of uh, open source tools that uh, I had good experience with, so I can publish it uh, uh, later on Twitter. So you can take a look. Um, and see if uh, if uh, either one helps you. 
Okay, that's a very good answer. Shia, so much. Thank you for the nice talk and the Q and A, uh, long Q and A. Sorry for that. Thanks everybody for listening the whole day. I hope you had learned. So for the morning, the very nice opening session from Lisa Forty. Now we have said Shira Shaban for the closing session. Tomorrow morning, I'm again here to uh, open the conference with a keynote from Astrid Osenberg. It's uh, 9 a.m. in Ireland, UK time and 10 a.m. Central European time. Shira, thank you again. Thanks for all you do in our and your company is wish the best. Have fun in California. And uh, I see you soon in person, I hope. Thank you. And thank okay, you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.